Good evening, everyone. Thank you very, very much for coming on a day that seemed like it was if, iffy, to say the, the least. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, after my talk, uh, hopefully I'll be short. Well, I won't be because I never am. Uh, we have refreshments and food and wine, snacks and wine afterwards. They're free. But of course, we have a donation box. So that's bear that in mind. Um, Neville outside is dispensing coffee for hard cash. You can play with SnapScan. He's in fact collecting money for, he's a committee member of the Sunflake Trust and he's, it goes towards his Feinbos garden that he's developing in Freyhrunt against great odds. So we try and support him as much as we can. Um, there will be four more talks after tonight, uh, consecutive Thursdays, excepting the last one, which is a Wednesday. The 27th is a Wednesday. Um, so you can see the posters. There's one on the door. Uh, the ladies is th through that door there, and the gents is this side. I believe we're allowed to swap these things nowadays. <laughs> <clears throat> what else? Uh, oh, um, I have to give big thanks to Pam Golding Estates, the su southern um, area, um, not only for supporting us and helping us to run this program, but Kim has produced a rugby schedule for the World Cup matches. And there's a box of them at the back. And each of the Springbok games is highlighted in green. And there's be a function at Frank's in the East Lake Shopping Center for each game? For each game, for all the games. For all the games. And it will be there on the 17th of September. OK. And, and there will be snacks there. So don't go too mad. <clears throat> If there's anything else I've forgotten, Julie will remind me. So the history of Sunflay. I didn't grow up in Cape Town, although I've been here for more than 30 years. I've only lived in this area for the last 12. Um, so I, I don't know the nuances of the most recent history. Um, but just I've hobbled together this presentation from images from all over the place. But most of them have come from the Sunflay Trust archives, as well as the Cape of Diab. D-I-A-B, Facebook page, which is a fantastic resource of historic pictures of the peninsula mainly, but Table Bay, East London, Port Elizabeth, Old Johannesburg, Old Potchefstroom. It's really a fantastic page to follow on Facebook. So you can say there is something worthwhile that you can do there, um, not just moan. <clears throat> so I have an affinity for geology, and I was going to start my talk three billion years ago. Um, <clears throat> when the earth was young, but I was told we have to be out here by 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. So I thought <clears throat> I would fast forward by 2.997 billion years to a mere 3 million years ago. But why 3 million years? Because that's, apart from the ancient fossil history that we find in the, the Cape system rocks, we don't have a lot of uh, proof of life in this area until about 3 million years ago. And this comes from the West Coast Fossil Park, which is an incredible place. It's one of the most incredible fossil um, sites in the world where the animals died in situ can be seen in the ground where they died. And that's quite, it's not unique in the world, but there's only three or four places in the world where that occurs. And what was life like then? And here, it was like that. It was subtropical forest, amazing as it may seem. Um, I won't go into the geology of South America and Antarctic, but um, there was a great cooling of conditions between five and three million years ago, and the forest slowly receded. Um, living in that forest were four species of extinct elephants, one with four tusks. There were giant short-necked giraffes called um, civetheans. There were giant hyenas and buffalo. There was an African bear. There were, it was a completely different scenario to what we have today. So it would have been like that or similar here. That's why I start there. You have to try and imagine that. It's quite incredible. Um, and then from about three million years ago, the Feinbos um, regime starts getting established. Feinbos actually originates from the East African highlands. It's an Afromontane vegetation type. So it jumped the mountain ranges down to the Cape, progressively with the ebb and flow of climatic conditions over the past 10 million years, established here three million years ago. 
And what else was happening three million years ago? Well, probably Australopithecus africanus was wandering around, if not here, certainly in South Africa. So we don't have the evidence because we don't have fossil records of that period, but it might have been. And Australopithecus was not the only hominid in Southern Africa at that time. There were several um, hominid species, hominin species, but that's one that might have been here. But what we do know is that around about 700,000 years ago, the skull discovered in the Soldana area called Soldana Man, might have been a woman, who knows. Um, so we have the skull of a hominin. Uh, so whoever was living at Soldana almost certainly lived along the coastline of the Cape, of the southwestern Cape. So something like that would have had a skull and it was very different to us lived here. What did these things, these species look like? Well, here we have an artist representation of uh, Australopithecus africanus. The next one is Australopithecus sediba, found in the cradle of humankind um, from around about 2 million years ago. Um, Homo naledi, the greatest hominin find since Mrs. Pless, the first one, um, in the cradle of humankind. And there's such a movement of these species through southern and east Africa, almost certainly something like them lived here. We don't know. What we do know is that around about 100,000 years ago, there were footprints made on the shores of Longabon, footprints in the sand. So something or someone walked along the shores of Longabon Lagoon and left the footprints of an upright being. Was it Homo sapiens? Very likely. Homo sapiens would go back, give or take a, a while, you know, 120, 200,000 years ago, more or less. Don't shoot me, I'm not a paleontologist, but something like that. So if they were at Longabon, we can assume they were here. <clears throat> and they left their marks. This is Dip Cliff near Elan Spy. And if you've been to Elans by itself, the cave above the, the sea has got marks like that. That was very typical of koi, a very distinct to sand hunter-gatherer. Koi, semi or nomadic pastoralists, had a very different kind of culture. They were cattle people. So their art is very different to the, the, the mystical type of art, the representational art of the sand people. I use those terms just to distinguish that they, they're very different DNAs. They're not the same. There was one time thought to be the same, but they're not. So here's just two snapshots of 1.5 million years ago during what is called an interglacial period when the sea level was much higher. That's what it looked like where we are now. So there was a disconnect between the islands and the mainland of what you can obviously note is the Cape Peninsula, but it wouldn't have been that then. And then fast forward to 20,000 years ago, a glacial maximum when all masses of fresh water are trapped in the massive glaciers of the northern hemisphere, sea levels rose, uh, dropped considerably, and the entire area was basically sand flats with some prominent mountains sticking out. So 20,000 years ago, what was happening here? Something like that. Now that was called Fishhook Man. That's just a <clears throat> misogynistic way of defining things. Fishhook people lived in Piers Cave. And how do we know this? We know this because in 1928, uh, a certain gentleman, Victor Piers, his son Bertie and a neighbor excavated Piers Cave. And this is an um, extract from the Cape Times on March the 3rd, 1928. And I call it the folly of amateur archaeology. Um, in the caption, which you can't read there, it says, apart from all the other things there, what, among what was found, it says, note the sudden outcrop of rubbish, shells, bones, and stones, to be thrown away. But that wasn't the worst of it. <laughs> the worst of it was that white line represents the original cave floor. So how do you get rid of three meters of rubble? You dynamite it. So that's what they did. They dynamited the ancient history of Piers Cave to get to who knows what. And all of that is just rubble strewn down the slopes of Piers Hill, Piers Cave Hill. Now you could probably go there and find ancient tools. 
All right, so that's the beginning of the human story that we have a definite timeline of. Um, I made my own timeline, recent timeline of Sunflower, so 200,000 years ago, Piers Cave. I'm not going through the whole Portuguese and blah, 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 but as regards Sunflower, I'm going to focus in on Sunflower now. 1670s, the Dutch East India Company establishes a cattle post just up the road here. 1740s, they established a military post, the Porthes. Porthes. 1795, the Battle of Musenberg, first British occupation. 1820, Pecks Inn Hotel opens, pretty close to the, um, the Atlantic Road traffic lights in Musenberg. 1882, the first railway line built across um, the northwest shore of the Flay. 1884, the first rowing regatta held on the, on, the, on the lake. 1906, or somewhere, could it could be 1909, I've seen both dates, the Imperial Yacht Club was founded. 1940s, somewhere around there, begins the canalization of our river systems that we see today as concrete sluts and all the ramifications that, that has wrought upon us. Um, the Marina de Gama established in the early 1970s and apart from the, uh, the human management of the flay that will be the subject of the talk in two weeks time by Andy Killick, we now come to the, the beginning of the next phase of our lives and the life of our water bodies is the livable urban waterways project. So when the Dutch arrive here and open a cattle station, they're basically pressurizing the koi, what they called hot and tots, um, into relinquishing their cattle by fair and foul means, by barter, by trade, by raids. And so begin the land wars in the Cape. Um, very little known about it generally, but they started almost immediately the Dutch set foot here. In fact, they started the day the Portuguese set foot here, but that's another story. Um, so, who are here? The Khoringakwa people, or Karpmans, moving their cattle seasonally between here, over Okarpsevach, to the Cape Point area, depending on the seasonal rains and the availability of grass. And the reason this has never been a major cattle area, because there ain't much grass in the Fainbos. And if you look at the the line that demarcates the Fainbos from the grasslands, it's pretty much the Fish River, or Port Elizabeth, if you like. And that's why then black folks in Guinea, with their very large herds, never came further. There just wasn't enough grass. They'd been there for a long, long time, <clears throat> which is allowed white settlers to believe it was open land. Just the koi were in their way, and then the sand. So it's been suggested the pre-industrial communities had much easier lives than we. Uh, there was very little to do once you had established, got food for the day, which didn't often take long when it was good times. And so those were much better times probably. There was a lot of time for socializing, for, for making um, art, artifacts, and for storytelling, which is a vital part of uh, pre-industrial pre cultures. So 1670s, the Dutch East India Company establishes this cattle post, Lakeside. It would have been there, and why there? because that's where the fresh water comes in. And that's where the koi or the khuring hakwa would have hung out, mainly in the winter months, to take advantage of the fresh water coming into the flay, into the estuary uh, up at that point. So when the Dutch arrived, the semi herd, as I said, would have used the upper reaches of the flay. But once the Dutch moved their herds into this area, the khuring hakwa had to move. So where did they move? They moved to the hinterland, over the Hantu Pass, the Hottentots Holland, and towards Hermanus. But those areas were already occupied by semi-nomadic groups. So there was the bumping up conflict that also we see later in South Africa in the Difakwani Wars, the times of Shaka and Moshesh and the Selikatsi. There's pressure for land and grazing for cattle and the slave trade in that case. By the way, kwa, as in Otanikwa or Huringha kwa, means people. So Otanikwa means the honey people which is kind of like a metaphor for the land of milk and honey, which is the area around George, the garden route. This is one of the first maps we have of this area. And you probably can't read, but we have Dubai a false, the Carps a Flakta, and there we have the Zant Fale. <coughs> um, no sign yet of any human settlement on this map circa 1700. But very soon we get hit post haste, not a post office, 
as a lot of people think, it's a guard house. It, there was a military outpost here to guard the cattle. Um, so, um, and then if you, if you could read oh, the map back, um, it says the, the place was spelt Mays, M U Y S, S B U R G. So the place of Mays, not Mays's Mountain. That was a misnomer that came into common usage quite a lot later. So now that the Khoi are um, disowned of their cattle, what do they do? A lot of, we, know this, we know the name, the Strandlopers. Um, Strandlopers is not a preferred way of life for um, essentially uh, pastoralists. The Khoi were forced into a life of um, living off the coast, living on the bounty of the sea, and using fish traps. And some of the tidal pools in Flas Bay are the sites of old koi fish traps. As are, if you look from the Komiki Road down onto the Slungkop Lighthouse, you can see the semicircular shapes of old fish traps that haven't been um, you know, maintained for three, 350 years. But uh, these fish traps can be found all along the Southern Cape Coast, right up to Stillby. I don't know if they're any further. But... And in fact, um, the historic Musburg Battle site up on Boys Drive is built on a massive midden, shell midden, that would have been where the Khoi people went up from the beach for safety and ate. So everything was glorious until around 1713. Well, it wasn't glorious, there was land battles. But in 1713, a Danish ship came into Table Bay and offloaded. Although there were strict laws about it, they knew they had fever on the ship. They offloaded their laundry and it got taken up to um, the Plutter Clip in the Plutter Gorge where the laundry was done by slaves and it was ridden with yellow fever. I mean, smallpox with yellow fever, smallpox. So that's the first smallpox outbreak in the Cape. And it completely changed the whole scene of, of, of this because, well, there, there's two meanings to the word decimate. The original meaning means one in 10. And it comes from the Roman times. If the Roman army lost a battle, um, a centurion was, was divided up into 10 lots of 10. And nine people had to pull a short straw Never pulled a short straw, had to be decimated by his brothers, killed. So that's the origin of the word decimate. But we use it in the sense of nine in ten. And that's what befell the Khoi people. Nine in ten approximately died. What was the consequence of that? <clears throat> well, a lot of things. Mainly that the Khoi were first forced into either slavery or servitude for the colonists. And it completely changed the balance of power, which had been pretty even actually up until that point. So that was the first of um, at least three major smallpox outbreaks in the Cape. I found this lovely um, rendering. Sketches were made on Rensky's farm in the Drakensberg district, which was being used as a temporary plague hospital in the 1750s. Um, so that really was a huge problem for those communities, indigenous, who didn't have the immunity, as is the case, was the case in uh, North America. So, Early to mid 1700s, there's a new VOC map showing Dubai Falls and the Zant Valley. But if you could look, you could notice that the, the human footprint is starting to um, manifest with the names of fishing ports, um, whaling, also used for whaling, and farms. And there's a couple of names there that you would see De Steenbergen, Meisenberg. Meisenberg has now become Meisenberg. And the colonial footprint is making itself felt on this part of the, the coastline. Here's a close-up uh, showing the Saint Falais, the VOC military post at, at Meuseberg, which is here, military post there. That's the post taste now. Um, it's likely this map shows the full extent of Saint Falais in winter and not what it would look like in the drier summer months. You can see the multiple channels coming out from the southeast part of the flay. And then Gaboom, 7th of August, 1795. I like to say that Sergeant Mace came out of the post the stable doors, and he zipped down his pants. They didn't have zips, but he unbuttoned his pants to take a pee, and he peed all over his lovely polished buckle shoes because there was the entire fleet of Lord Admiral Elphinstone waiting to attack this little military post here. He must have, you know what I mean, pooped in his pants. <clears throat> So that was a full-blown attack on the Cape, and they, they landed here because there was only a very small military presence. In fact, there was a very motley crew made up of Pandurs, 
which were mixed race troops, um, mercenaries, and a few Dutch, German, Swedish soldiers. Also mercenaries, because remember the Cape is ruled by a company, the first multinational company in the world, the VOC, not by the Dutch government. It was never a Dutch colony. It was only ever a VAS, VOC. So I don't know who goes and shops at Checkers, but if you noticed, there's a cannonball there. That's before my time. Apparently it was dug up in 1991 when the new Checker Center was built on the site of the old, um, the first inn that I mentioned earlier. I just found some lovely pictures of this area. That's the lower um, Constantia Valley. And um, people often say, where does the name Constantia come from? And there are lots of stories, but the best I can have found, and I've researched it quite a lot, is that Private enterprise was forbidden by the company, but Simon von der Stel got permission from one of the here in Seventeen on his way back from Batavia to Holland to start a model farm to extend the farming, the agricultural output of the of the colony, and to suck up to the to the director of the company whose daughter's name was Constantia, he named this huge holding Constantia, and then Groot Constantia the, the home. So after the British invasion, British rule turned the Cape from a rough and tough Dutch outpost. And there are amazing chronicles of the cruelty that the Dutch inflicted on the slaves of this. Passing ship's captains wrote in their logs about the unbelievable cruelty that they encountered at the Cape that they didn't find anywhere else in the world. And we don't know that. We never taught that. But it really was quite remarkable. And it's in the records. Um, Anyway, the British turned it into a thriving European colony, very bucolic, beautiful, pastoral, a very genteel place, if you were British. Just note the sand dunes. I wonder if my little pointer will work. The sand dunes around there on the beach area, quite prominent in this view, which we <coughs> assume is quite um, accurate. <coughs> then from 1828, Farmer Peck, there were two Peck brothers, actually, and they were farmers in the valley. And they established an inn. Um, they opened a store. It was located at the inn section of Main and Atlantic Roads, where the Checker Center is now. By the mid-1880s, it was a thriving hotel. Um, the Pecks were originally from Oxfordshire. They attained a license from the Simonstown Licensing Board to sell malt and wines. So that turned it into quite a social hotspot on the wagon route from Cape Town to Simonstown. And it became known as Farmer Peck's Inn or Farmer Peck's Hotel. Just a nice image, very, very early for black and white photograph, the earliest I've found of our area. So it would have been mid to late 19th century. Just showing that there's quite a lot of development now. There's a lot of small holdings, farms, a lot of orchards, tree um, shelters, wind shelters, a lot of activity going on in the area. As I mentioned earlier, 1882. A steam rail service uh, reaches the flay. In fact, in 1873, the line was started from Cape Town to Weinberg. Then in 18, 1873, in 1882, it reached Musenberg. And then finally in 1890, it finally got to Simonstown, where Prasa can't get a train today. <laughs> 1884. So the reason Circuflay and Suntflay became recreational area was for rowing. It was a big thing. There were rowing regattas. The main club was in Table Bay and they held annual regattas in, in these three um, areas. And so that was a reason for trying to, well, over the first um, attempts to impound the water to create an artificial permanent water body that was deep enough for recreational boating. 1890, that's Main Road and uh, the building so in the foreground, that's the toll house, which doesn't exist anymore. This is my favorite shot. This is the Kingfisher prototype, a steam powered reed cutter. Now, I know nothing about that and I, would, I don't know even how to date it, but it comes from the Sunflay Trust archives. Just a photograph there without a caption, it's fantastic. And then early in the 20th century, a petrol powered one. Uh, so obviously reed cutting was a thing. It was, there wasn't a weed related activity. It was probably commercial reed cutting for matting. You know, Sponge Chamat Road, somebody said it was about Spanish silver. 
nonsense. It's sponsche mat, Spanish mat. It was from the reed used for making matting for awnings or fencing or all of those things that we still use it for. 1908, that's the first bridge across the estuary mouth made of timber and a gravel bridge, rubble. Um, note that the, the, the mouth hasn't been impounded in any way yet, but this would have greatly um, facilitated movement, traffic around the flay, moving people and goods. Um, early 20th century, just messing about in boats. So, to, the, 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 oh yeah, the Imperial Yacht Club was founded in 1906 out of the, the Lakeside Voting Company, which had been founded around 1890. So just a lovely old picture. This used to hang in the old Rustenburg Pharmacy, as I say, carving it up at um, Surfer's Corner. And I say some of the notable hotties of the day were George Bernard Shaw and Agatha Christie, who came to visit the Cape for health reasons and body boarded. Um, this is the first pavilion built in 1910 out of timber, but um, it, the maintenance proved very tricky and 1928 it had to be demolished. So the second pavilion looked like this. It was built out of concrete, but not very well and the rebar very quickly deteriorated and rusted, which caused cracking and crumbling of the concrete interest, the concrete structure. And so that had to be torn down around about 1970. Now, I never knew that building, but I believe some people did. I'm not old enough, but I call it the Halcyon days. Uh, Halcyon actually means the calm water. The myth is that uh, there was a, a kingfisher that lay that made a nest on the ocean, would have been the Mediterranean, when the waters were calm. So they're not good days, they're calm days. And so one of the genera of kingfishers today is Halcyon. Musenberg Beach, circa 1912. Just note the back beach area here, quite extensive, and that would have flooded seasonally very much like Nurtuk back beach area does today um, in the winter when the ground gets saturated. Um, Musenberg Beach a little few years later. The donkey rides were quite a feature, not only of Musenberg, but of social functions, markets, as well as rich kids' birthday parties. And there's still quite a strong um, equestrian tradition on the Cape Flats. There's an annual horse and cart uh, affair in the Casa, and in Marmara they have a, an annual street race, for street race, very much like a, with the one in Italy where they run around the streets. It's not quite as elaborate or colorful, but it's um, somewhere in Tuscany they do it. So 1922, sailing on Sanfle. Just the yachties will note the square rigged sails, very, um, uh, I think it's called a spanker type sail, which um, you didn't see before and then you see disappearing after this time. I just thought it was a notable thing. This is the, um, the regal old Imperial Yacht Club uh, committee, I guess, um, circa 1920. Some of your relatives, perhaps? I don't know. And love this, speed trials on boys' drive. And now this is something I think we should reinstate. <laughs> Imagine the crowd puller it would be. The first city council map I could find and it's undated. I'm assuming it's 1930s or early 1940s. A note off the map, the bottom red, probably uh, the map, no, that's my note. Um, some very interesting things are visible in the drawing. Note the sand river in the area of Prince George's Drive. That's there, going out there. Um, it crossed Prince George's Drive to the east and back again to the western side. So it goes out and comes back again. The road south of Military Road was called Margate Road. Also note the Sand River did not connect to Princess or Little Princess Flays. So historically that's quite interesting if you're involved in any way in the management of the Sand River catchment. 1960s is uh, Imperial Yacht Club. Uh, not much different today. And then we come to the early 1970s and it's the establishment. So this would have been possibly late 1970s into the 1980s, because the first um, area established would have been, I think, around here. The first houses, about 50 houses were built by the Anglo-American property um, company. But I'd just like to compare the flay. This would have been probably midsummer or late summer. The water body is very small. There are pools that have accumulated. There's the sand river coming in, the original channel. Here's the sand river canalized. 
with Wildwood Island there, Park Island there, and I guess that's Bird Island. So you see the, the shape of the, the water bodies then and now, quite different. Here comes the railway line, so we can make quite a nice comparison of the two. So historically, that's a lovely um, set of maps to have. This is the original dredging by the Anglo-American properties. The plan was much more ambitious. There were going to be a lot more aspects to um, the, the, the development, including a golf course and a small craft harbor in surface corner, between the mouth and surface corner. So the aquatic gods looked down on us with pleasure and made sure that that didn't happen, thank God, that they never came about. Um, in fact, uh, I was hoping Gerald Rosenthal would be here this evening, but he was involved with the planning of the original Marina de Gama. So there may still be some people around who will remember the Blue Moon Hotel of Lakeside, a very cool hotspot, demolished in 1968, long before my time. Apparently it was a hopping hotspot on Friday nights. You see the tricky soda and the black jeans. Who remembers Nicky, uh, Dickie Loder in the blue jeans? In fact, the, the resident band was called the Drifters, and they played mainly um, uh, acoustic um, instrumentals of mainly Shadows covers. A guest band such as Dickie Loder in the blue jeans would have played Buddy Holly uh, and the Crickets, Bill Haley and the Comets, and Elvis mainly. Um, so I don't know if any of you would have been there, or your moms or your dads, but that was Friday night at the Blue Moon Hotel in Lakeside. I don't know exactly, but it would have been on Main Road. Okay. So watercolor by a chap Ralph Mitchell, who lived in the area in the 1950s. I hope that's not me. No. <laughs> Oh, housekeeping, won't you all turn off your phones? <laughs> okay. no. It's not me. So this is what our rivers looked like before canalization. This is, in fact, the Salt River. But all of our rivers would have looked like that once upon a time. Um, so before the Golden Age, what I call the Golden Age of social and environmental engineering, when the engineers believed they had a contract from God to pave the entire planet. Um, <laughs> Today, there are about 400 kilometers of paved riverways, waterways, in this greater city of Cape Town. 400 kilometers, previously identifying as rivers or waterways. Um, and I say, it's time to break down those walls, Mr. Mayor, if you remember. Here's the 1950s of the concrete bridge and the impoundments at the, at the, 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 the walls, the concrete walls, which are now breaking down and are in the planning process of replacing them with what are called softer shoulders, much like the Gabion walls that are being built along the eastern edge of the flay now to prevent erosion on that side. But these are crumbling and there's something. So there's been quite a lot of um, talking and planning and public participation about what should replace it. One of the plans was to completely scrap it, allow the mouth to meander as it will. But Modern development doesn't allow for that, unfortunately, maybe in a later time. But the real reason for canalization is, this is taken in Cape Town in June 2023. This is what flooding does. Um, and in the Dip River retreat to Kai area, a lot of the, some of the commercial buildings had massive, massive flooding problems along the Kaisers River because there's just no flow. It's flat. There's no drainage. And this was a, I don't know if it was a one in a hundred year or one in a 300 year flood, but it was one of those maximum events that were not planned for. Um, so some serious intervention was needed. I took this from Joe Marks Road Boulevard a little while ago, and I say, these, the sluice formally identifying as the Sand River. If it looks like a slurt or a sluice, the people will use it as a slurt or a sluice. And 50% of our problems are coming down that channel. We need to reclaim our rivers. 
So the people again will see them as rivers and understand them to be rivers. And until that happens, there will be no engagement with communities. I promise you, trust me on that. So this is a photo taken during um, one of the major pollution events. It was a huge sewage spill. And load shedding has had a lot to uh, answer for in screwing up our, our pump station systems, which weren't built to deal with the tripping and the outages that come with load shedding, but also massive vandalism and theft of our pump stations. So you can blame a whole litany of people on, on the state of the flay. Um, and it would have got worse, but I mean, I go to bed every night and pray to a God I don't have that Jordan Hill Lewis is the mayor of Cape Town because he has implemented massive programs to try and address these. And I don't know how he's done it, but he's turning the entire bureaucracy of the Cape Town City Council around to do something astonishing work. <laughs> Nineteen ninety eight marks the birth of the Sunflay Trust. And it began with clearing um, alien vegetation all along the, the lakeside shore of the lake and then planting the garden that is now there on what used to, had become a tip site. Um, it needs attention now after some decades of letting it grow wild, which is cool. We'll get in there and we'll start cutting it down and sort of discouraging the vagrants who have taken it over of late. But you know, they're homeless people. We can chuck them out of lakeside, but they're going to go somewhere. Because they ain't got no homes. But anyway, this is a recent, one of several recent lovely sightings in the flay, a sand shark or guitar shark or whatever you want to call it. Um, the lowering of the rubble weir near the Royal Road Bridge consecutively over a few years has allowed for much greater marine interaction and to reestablish the, the, the estuary. It's an estuary. It's not a flay or a lake. It's an estuary. Uh, it should have a tidal zone uh, and that's increased. So the salinity of the flay has increased over the past decade, and that has encouraged the, um, the influx of marine life, marine organisms, and to the detriment of fresh, some water fresh, freshwater species like birds particularly. But in the long run, it's absolutely necessary for the health of the flay, and um, it's ongoing. Um, Chiron noted this uh, conga eel, I think we had an extreme low water event a year or two ago, and the mud areas of between the, the Sand River Mouth and Bird Island, he saw for the first time I think it's ever been recorded here, I think it's a Cape Conga eel. There have been debates of what eel it was. But I saw a seagull flying over, I was sitting on Teeson's Bridge, and I thought, snake, and they dropped it on a sandbar, and it's one of those eels. So that's a new species for us. It's an Indo-Pacific species, it's almost worldwide, but I don't think it had been recorded here before. But then there was 2003, and you know our troubles all come from, most of them come from upriver, and I won't go into all of them, but uh, this year it's been very hard to manage the inflow of, of, of um, floodwaters and the litter that comes down with it. These are the two chaps employed by Sunflow to clear the nets in the sand river mouth, and it ain't a pretty job. Today they pulled a dead dog out of there <clears throat> amongst 60 bags of litter. And, you know, we could work that seven days a week and we wouldn't address the litter problem. So we must imagine, imagine a fully functioning estuary one day with much more fish, the bird life thriving, a world-class venue for water sports, a dream that might yet come true in our lifetimes. And finally, my last slide, second last slide, imagine the Livable Urban Waterways Project, which is about to get kick-started across the sand river catchment. Five pilot projects to, to begin the process of rejuvenating our river systems. When I moved to Cape Town about 35 years ago, I never thought that would happen in my lifetime. I really didn't. But there are enlightened people in the council, and they've been working on these projects for many, many years, and they've finally got momentum. And they're getting money in from big government donors, overseas government donors. So they're going to start being rolled out in the next year and two years. We're going to see changes for the better that will that um, kind of herald in a new era of conservation. So that's it. That's my talk.